Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios, it's time for Women in Motion. Brought to you by WBEC West. Join forces, succeed together. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Women in Motion, and this is going to be a good one. But before we get started, it's important to recognize our sponsor, Webeck West. Without them, we couldn't be sharing these important stories. Today on Women in Motion, we have Katie Weber with Demeter Design. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to learn what you're up to. Tell us about your firm. How are you serving folks? Yeah, so Demeter Design, I started in 2020. And we are a design and animation studio located in Los Angeles. So we have two primary branches of our service offerings. We are a full service motion design studio, and we're also a traditional graphic design studio. So that's more B2B stuff and yeah, everything that graphic design entails from web design to consumer package design to digital marketing. So that's us. So what's your backstory? Have you always been involved in uh, design? I have, yeah. I started in the motion design world, which uh, for people who don't know that term, that's basically design plus animation. So it's usually for commercial or web products or television as opposed to feature animation, like what you would think of Pixar doing. So I started that back in Chicago in 2007, and I did that for about 12 years or so. And then I started branching more into traditional graphic design, so static design, not moving. And I started my company in 2020. Now, as a a young person, were you like the person who drew and was into it at that age as well? Or did this come like as you kind of got older? No, I've been drawing and doing art my entire life. I come from a very creative family. So my dad is a painter. I had a great uncle who is an architect. Several of my uncles are craftsmen, you know, working with wood and sculpture. And, you know, I have a lot of chefs in my family. So growing up, we were very much encouraged to be creative, and I've been drawing ever since I can remember. Now, what was it like growing up in that environment? Because a lot of uh, young people, especially when they're real little, you know, art is, you know, a passion. That's something part of their personality they do. But as they get older, they a lot of people just kind of gradually outgrow it. And then there's some peer pressure and parental pressure to get a real job that's more normal. How did you kind of fight that? And can you share that experience? Yeah. Well, so I was very fortunate that both of my parents really encouraged me to pursue whatever interested me, whatever I was passionate about. So there was never any doubt, you know, when I expressed, well, I actually went to school for creative writing and film. So not exactly what I ended, well, both of them relate to what I ended up doing, but um, I was always just encouraged to explore my creative passions. And, uh, you know, my dad had a traditional nine to five. He worked in the insurance business, but he would come home and he would paint or play the guitar. But I think that he always dreamed of, he he sort of regretted not having a creative career. So, you know, he always pushed me towards that, towards doing what I loved. But I also grew up, you know, watching parents that worked really hard. And so I have that Midwestern work ethic that's been instilled in me my whole life. So it was never a question of, okay, I'm just going to dawdle around with this and, you know, my parents will support me. It was always, I have to make a living at the same time. So that was what really inspired me to try to find a way to make a living with my creativity. As you were growing up, did you find that there were some people that you thought were talented but were dropping off and not pursuing kind of a creative career because of pressures? Hmm, That's an interesting question. Um, I suppose so. Uh, I I think most of my friends, actually, um, not a lot of my friends from high school and college did go into creative careers. I have a lot of people who 
went into not the nonprofit world or teaching or healthcare, all different things. But um, everyone kind of pursued their passion. Since going into this field, of course, I've met tons of extremely creative people who have made that their career. So I feel like I'm, and especially living in, and working in Los Angeles, I feel like I'm really surrounded by hardworking, ambitious, creative types. So was you fell into kind of a community and you've been able to kind of collaborate and work together and learn from each other? Yes, absolutely. I, you know, the motion design world is such an incredible community. Um, the The field itself was very young when I started. I didn't even really know what it was back then because it was in its very early years. And so, and we were all kind of learning and developing this new art form together. So there was so much collaboration and teaching of each other. People would put free tutorials up on the internet, like, hey, I don't know how to do this. And that someone would make a tutorial about it and sharing tools and resources. So yeah, it's really been an incredible community. Now, how did you make the transition into, you know, being super creative, obviously, and then kind of the business side of it, at some point, you have to sell somebody something and persuade someone to buy something. So how do you kind of wear both of those hats? Because sometimes the selling part is tricky for a creative. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I would I would say that I love all aspects of running my business, but the sales aspect is probably my least favorite because I never want to persuade someone to do or buy something that they don't believe in. So I guess I still would say I'm not the strongest salesperson, but the way that I do sell is just by sharing my own passion about the work and really feeling confident that I have a good product to offer. So I don't feel like I'm, you know, selling snake oil. It's like I've worked my entire career to hone this skill set. And I I know what I can do to help a smaller business succeed. Um, and I want to use my skills to help them. So just trying to share that passion with others. Now, I find a lot of people in the creative fields, they have a difficulty in pricing or pricing um, because it's so subjective. Mm-hmm. How did you, do you remember kind of uh, maybe the on an early project to how do you come up with a price? You know, how do you, you know, even kind of quanta, quantify your, you know, how much things cost and how much, because if you're getting paid for your brain, basically, and, and ideas, and as well as the execution of them, it's hard to really, you know, have a, uh, kind of a a more direct way of quantifying. Okay, that's X number of dollars because it took X number of minutes. Because you know, you're it's creative. It, it, the idea can come in a minute. It could come in in a, a week. You know. Yeah. Well, that is a tricky thing, and I've found that the easiest way to do it, and people have different philosophies about this. You know, like if if you're designing a logo for a giant corporation. And, you know, it might take you a week to do the logo, but it's going to live with them for decades and it's going to help them earn millions and millions of dollars. You're going to price that differently than if you're working with a small business and they have a fixed budget and they're just trying to amp up their social media or give themselves a brand refresh. And I, we tend to work with smaller businesses. So we are working with those startups and we're always conscious of cost. And of course, we factor in our expertise. And so I raise my rates every so often to um, to reflect my growing expertise. But I tend to really think about it in terms of how much time it's going to take, including the time when I'm thinking. So, you know, I might spend a day just hunting for inspiration. And in the back of my mind, I am developing ideas. So I would charge that as a day. And then how many days it takes me to do the sketches and the um, all, all the different and then the freelancers that I bring in or my staff designer who's going to help in their hours. So I really do look at my actuals from similar jobs and and do it by how much time I think it's going to take because 
it is just really hard. It's it's kind of an abstract thing and it's hard to quantify otherwise and also to keep the prices consistent. But certainly if I do start working with really giant companies, I will take into consideration more than just the hours. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a value you provide. It goes beyond. It, that's why the hours is probably not the best way to, to calculate it. It's it's what kind of value you're delivering. Um, and like you said, it could be a multi, you know, billion dollar organization like mm-hmm. that. Just do it was three words, but, you know, it's yeah. generated a lot of money for them. You know, <laughs> more. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, or, you know, depending on how you look at it, we do tend to work with the small businesses. So um, and as a small business owner myself, I always want to be conscious of their budgets and as well. But um, certainly that pricing model will change as we grow. Now, uh, what's been the most rewarding part of the journey thus far? The most rewarding part, I would say, is the ability to have control over my life, basically, because the creative fields, you know, they're so competitive and they can be cutthroat and there's so, you can easily be taken advantage of as a creative person and just really work, you know, for a slave driver. This has happened to me in my career and I've seen it happen to other people where it's not uncommon for people to put in 12, 14, 16 hour days. And that was just not something that I ever felt comfortable with. I've always valued a work life balance and mental health and physical health. So I found that the best way to do that is to construct my own business. And yeah, having your own business, you can be a really tough boss on yourself and you can make yourself work around the clock. But the whole reason I'm doing it is so that. I can control that and I can say these are my office hours and unless there's a really urgent thing, I'm signing off at this certain hour. Um, And also, you know, having control over the clients. And if there's a client that you're really just not gelling with, you can move on after that project, project and not work with them again. And you just you can construct the business however you want, uh, which gives you a lot more freedom and control over your own life. Now, when you decided to go out on your own, was that something that you were looking forward to or was that something you were kind of nervous about? Like, you know, Uh, taking that leap is a leap, you know, it's a little bit of the unknown. Absolutely. I was definitely scared. I, you know, as as you always are going into the unknown, but. In my field, it's very common to be a freelancer. So really, I've been in the business for about 16 years. And I would say, I I was just thinking about this the other day. I think I've only worked full time for another company for maybe about six of those years. So I'm very used to being on my own. And this company was just an extension of the freelancing and it was just making it more official and bringing in other people to help me. But essentially, it's just still, you know, the freelance life. So, yeah, I guess it's something I've gotten used to. And any advice for that young creative entrepreneur out there that's, um, you know, maybe a little apprehensive about taking the leap? Yeah. So I would say, you know, Whether you work for yourself or you work for someone else, you're going to encounter stress in your job, especially if you're an ambitious person and you keep climbing the ranks. You're going to have some difficulties. So you have to think about what type of stress you want to deal with. And working for someone else, as I mentioned earlier, you have the stress of not having as much control over your schedule and your life. And also you can be laid off or lose your job at any time. Working for yourself, it's a whole different bag of stresses. And it can be, you know, you you might have some sleepless nights. There's some really difficult times. So you have to decide if, if that type of stress is for you, the uncertainty and really hustling constantly for new clients, new work. Um, and you also have to decide if, you're passionate enough 
not just about your craft or whatever, you know, if you're in, in retail, whatever you're selling, but all the different aspects of running a business. Because as a small business owner, you're going to be, you have to know a little bit about or a lot about all these things. So admin and legal stuff and marketing and client relations. You have to, I would say, not only be able to tolerate, but actually find some enjoyment in all these different areas because otherwise it's going to be really tough to persevere. So if you if you're interested in learning, you know, you don't have to know all this stuff as an expert going in, but if you have a creative or a curi- a curious mind and you are passionate about learning and, and growing in these areas, then I would say it's the right path for you. But you know, it's not easy, but it is so rewarding because all of the successes, you know, they just feel so earned and they feel so much greater because you've done it for yourself. And um, I have two more pieces of advice. I, I wrote a list, actually, because this is really important, I feel like. So um, another thing I would say is let your business grow organically. Don't grow too fast. Uh, I will say I've worked with other small businesses where I've seen them grow a little too fast because they got really excited. They got that one huge client that allowed them to double in size and hire a whole bunch of people or, or take out a big loan or something. But that's really risky because you never know when that one big giant kahuna of a client is going to go away or, or something unforeseen is going to happen. So my strategy has always been to grow um, organically and sustainably. And for me, that meant slowly, which is okay because, you know, I'm not trying to be the biggest agency in the world. I'm trying to have a sustainable company that will last for a long time. And then my final piece of advice is find a good accountant and listen to them. That's great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Now you mentioned community um, early on. How, like, how did you get uh, kind of hooked into the Webeck West community? What kind of drew you to them, and how have you leveraged that relationship? So I forget how exactly I found out about Webeck West, but I think another business owner might have told me about it. But I'm a pretty new member. I just joined last December. And I'm definitely planning on continuing because it's really been, it's it's such a great community. I've already met so many amazing people through it. And uh, I hope to really leverage, leverage it more. You know, I've done some of the training sessions and some have gone to some of the digital seminars and there's just such a wealth of, of offerings from Webeck, but I feel like by far the most important is are those interpersonal relationships that you develop through it. Because being a business owner and being a female business owner is it can be really lonely and it can, you know, a lot of it you're kind of it learning by trial and error and you feel like, okay, especially if you're the sole owner of the business. You don't have a lot of people to bounce your thoughts and ideas off of. So just being able to come together with so many successful women from different industries and learn from them and hear, you know, what's worked and what hasn't worked for them and just provide support for each other is really priceless. So what do you need more of? How can we help you? Um, I mean, I always need more work. I always need more clients. Uh, you know, networking and um, business matchmaking, I think, would be really great and and job uh, fairs and stuff and just introductions, you know, to bigger corporations. Because sometimes, and I've talked about this with other small business owners in Webeck, sometimes it can be really hard, you know, when you have a very small business and I have a very small business. It's just myself, and one other designer, and then we bring in freelancers as needed. But, you know, we have worked with some world-class brands. 
However, it's sometimes hard to convince the really large brands to trust a small, very small business. And so just having an organization like We Back West to sort of vouch for you and help make those introductions would be really helpful. Now, what does that ideal client look like uh, for you? Who is kind of that that client you'd like to clone and get more of? Well, I have to give a shout out to my longest client who's who's been with us since we started. We actually both launched our businesses at the same time, and that is Monica Blunder Beauty. They are a beauty startup, and uh, they they do cosmetics and skincare. And, um, they're just, they're just fantastic. And we love working with other, you know, small female owned businesses, especially in the beauty and wellness space and, you know, other businesses like that, or even larger cosmetics or, um, wellness companies that would be awesome to get more of them. And then the work you do for them, that could be branding, it could be logo, it could be packaging, yeah. like you do the whole gamut of anything, anything design related. Yeah, we, we've, we built their website. We, yeah, we do all of their packaging. We have done trade show booth design. So everything from that to the smallest, you know, social media ads that go on your phone. So yeah, all of it. And if somebody wants to learn more and connect with you or somebody on the team, what's the website? What's the best coordinates? Demeter.design is our website. There's no .com, just Demeter.design. And it's spelled a little funky, D-E-M-E-T-R-E dot design. So that's where you could find us. Well, Katie, thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're doing such important work and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you. All right, this is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Women in Motion.